Uh, pleasure to be here. Anyway, as Wei said, and Tim Simpson, I'm at uh, Penn State. I'm jointly in mechanical and industrial engineering and then also affiliated. We have an engineering design program there, which is nothing at all like what you guys have going on here. So it's been great seeing uh, sort of the scope and scale of things, which we're trying to slowly build to that level to some extent there. And as Wei said, I also uh, direct the learning factory at Penn State. Uh, today to talk, uh, as Wei said, kind of tell them a little bit about product family design, kind of what's been going on. I've actually been working in this area since uh, uh, my graduate studies back in uh, the, the late 90s there at Georgia Tech. And uh, as I was telling Walter this morning, really what I've been trying to do is help bridge, you know, from a management marketing side, everybody, you know, we need to do families, we need to have product variety, platforms is all good. But when I turned around and looked at what is available in the engineering world to help us do this, there wasn't a whole lot there. And that's really what I've been doing the past 10, 15 years now and trying to kind of build and put the pieces together to help engineers uh, design and develop product families. So I'll talk to you, kind of walk you through uh, some of the tools and methods and then uh, give you briefly an example of, of kind of what we're doing here lately uh, and try and sprinkle in a lot of good examples from industry as well from companies that uh, either I've worked with or you can read about in the literature there. I'd like to start off with this quote from uh, Mark Meyer and Al Leonard. This is their book, The Power of Product Platforms, kind of the, the first must read uh, in terms of product families and platforms. And I think this is sort of the mindset that we tend to educate, you know, our designers and our engineers is, you know, you want to go out and design the best product you can out there. And any, share, any sharing, any commonality you have between different products is going to, you know, it's going to, there's going to be some sort of sacrifice that you have to make. So I think as a result, uh, that sort of mindset transitions into companies there or the, you know, for whatever reason, designing new products as a time, one at a time, focusing on individual customers or individual market segments there, we fail to look across the range of products or think about range of customers or range of users. And as a result, we fail to uh, find opportunities to uh, take advantage of commonality, standardization, modularity, et cetera. And now, you know, in the past, say, 10 years with mass customization and product variety being such a big push, having this mindset, trying to create a variety of products, you start running into this problem here. Your inventory spiral out of control, that's mushrooming, diversification of your product lines, costs just, you know, start eating into your bottom lines, your margins go to zero or whatever and uh, it can be a problem. So really where a lot of companies have been going is trying to kind of find a good middle ground there. Can we think about a platform uh, from which we can create a family of products still provide the variety for the marketplace, yet get to market quickly, reduce our costs, and still sort of maintain uh, those competitive advantages? So before I go further, a couple of definitions for you. Product family, I loosely define as a, as a related, uh, group of related products that share common features, components, and subsystems yet satisfy or target a variety of different markets. And that sharing or that commonality is intentional. It didn't just kind of happen uh, because you both picked the same motor from the same, uh, you know, the same catalog or whatever. So that, is, that sharing is intentional. And that sharing, uh, the elements that are shared are embodied in the platform. And there are a variety of different definitions of platform from very part-centric all the way up to sharing you know, processes and, and whatnot. So very you know, organizational platforms, if you will. But essentially, sort of the common elements. What is it that you're sharing across this different product line. Of course, you know, we're talking, assuming about physical products, hardware, what have, you know, in the software world and services, I think there are lots of parallels here and sort of broadening that definition. And then actually the, the products themselves, you'll hear me refer to them either as derivatives, variants, uh, instances, or a family member. And these are the actual economic offerings. Typically, you're not selling the platform. This is basically the underlying core technology. There may be a one-to-one -one relationship between the, the platform and one of the products, but this is what you're selling. This is where you're making money. Uh, so the challenge, of course, then, is always how much time and money do you invest in this, given that this is what you need to sell, and this is what's going to make you money in the end. But these are the products, and typically, I'll give you some examples of these, uh, creating families through by deriving products from the platform. Traditionally, or, or most familiar, adding, subtracting, substituting modules, sort of this plug and play, create a module-based family, or another mode that we've seen a lot, scaling or stretching the platform in one or more dimension. I'll give you some examples of that a little bit later. A couple of examples to sort of set the stage here. Sony Walkman, one of the first that was fairly well cataloged uh, in the 1980s, dominated the, uh, the portable stereo market, really with three basic platforms. Hundreds of different models if you look at this, and you go in and can take these things apart. They're a little bit harder to find these days, uh, given the MP3 players and whatnot that are out there. But when you went and took these apart, you would see that there is a heck of a lot of commonality behind them. And what Sony was so successful at is figuring out, all right, how do we create the architecture so that we can then just have a different color faceplate or something so that everybody, when they go into the store, finds the Walkman that's exactly the right color that, that they want for them. 
And so very, you know, minor modifications, rearrangements, so they're able to do this cost effectively, and that's why they were able to dominate the marketplace for really 10, 15 uh, years with, uh, with those products. Likewise, lots of examples in the automotive industry. Some good, some not so good. Uh, Volkswagen has, been, has done well. This was in the, uh, the late 90s there, the A platform. You can see the wide range of cars, uh, all the different badges from Volkswagen to Skoda, Seat, and Audi. 19 different vehicles, you know, saving $1.5 billion per year. Everybody was out to, you know, how can we be like Volkswagen? How can we recreate this and do this? Of course, they run into some problems. If you're familiar with the story, uh, when they first fielded the, the Roadster, started, you know, gets, hot, gets fast enough, starts to fishtail because, you know, the platform for, you know, the sort of the needs for the Golf and the, the Beetle are very different for a sports car. So uh, they ran into some problems there and also, of course, uh, you know, when people found out as they got more and more press that you could get the same in the U.S., you know, an Audi and a Volkswagen were about the same, but, you know, five, six thousand dollars less or likewise in Europe, the cannibalization issues started to occur where people were buying the lower, uh, the, the lower cost one and getting the same quality sort of product there. If you look sort of under the hat or under the hood uh, of Volkswagen, so this is what you see. This is a commonality there, wheelbase dimensions, fuel tanks, axles, you know, as you would expect, a lot of this is shared. Uh, underneath across all those different vehicles and the approach is, all right, let's just put a different hat on them, badge it, Volkswagen, badge it, Audi, whatever, sell in the marketplace and be successful. Slightly different, I'll show you just as a counterexample, Ford, um, slightly broader definition there. And, and again, everybody uh, in the automotive industry, that the ones that I've, I've talked to and read about, has a slightly different uh, uh, sort of mindset or a slightly different definition of what, what the platform is here from Ford. Not only is it the common architecture, but you know, they also look at the interfaces. And more importantly, the hard points. Where does the car then come together on the assembly line? And so if you can then leverage, and for them, they're saying, you know, this really is where our biggest you know, investment, capital investment is in putting together a new plant. So the more we can leverage on the process side, on the manufacturing side, and basically have these same cars coming down the line, and the, the hard points are the same, then you can see the, sort of she, see the, uh, the sharing or the reuse there, all the components that are in yellow are reused across one or more of their cars from, you know, a two-door or a four-door to a hatchback to, you know, uh, an SUV there. So again, we're a little bit broader definition than what uh, a Volkswagen done. They've actually are now leveraging this, uh, uh, trying to extend this further into creating global platforms as, uh, as well. Um, really then the crux, as you can see in sort of some of these examples, uh, and the challenge then when creating a family of products, is really then in trying to balance the, the commonality with the distinctiveness. And I'm going to, a couple of figures here that are from a, a great paper by uh, Dave Robertson and Carl Ulrich, 1998 there about planning product platforms. And I like this chart because it sort of very succinctly shows or demonstrates, you know, the, this trade-off. Commonality on the one axis, uh, distinctiveness on the vertical axis there in terms of performance. Essentially, these are sort of the two, uh, two surrogate measures, if you will, the more commonality we have, the better uh, manufacturing cost savings, the cheaper it is to produce, et cetera. And the more distinctive it is, the better it performs, the better it's going to sell. Sales minus cost, there's your profit, you know, and that's what companies want to uh, try and maximize. Obviously, if everything is the same, then nothing is different. So we may be able to save a lot of money, but we're just producing the same product over and over and over again, and it's probably not going to do well in the marketplace. And in terms of automotive examples, K-Car, classic example in the late 80s, there, every car that came out, based on the K platform or Chrysler, looked like the K car. And uh, so it didn't do very well in the marketplace, even though they were saving lots of money because of the commonality in there in the architecture. And the flip side is if everything is different, well, then you start running these problems, you know, different product lines, tool length fixtures, et cetera, et cetera, that your costs are going to potentially skyrocket there. And the trick is really how do you find uh, the best architecture really to balance it to? And coming from the design side, I'm worried about, all right, how do we define the architecture for the product, for the coffee maker, for the, uh, you know, the ice scraper or whatever that is going to basically allow us to achieve uh, the best trade-off between those two. <coughs> so again, if you look at sort of three points on that, when you define, so then really when we're talking about designing within the product family, we're really talking about creating that platform architecture. And that really is then going to define uh, which curve you're operating on in some sense here in terms of being able to balance the commonality and distinctiveness within your family. You see here, I've just, you know, three points. A, very good, uh, has low commonality, but performs very well in terms of the uh, uh, distinctiveness, the uniqueness there, basically performs well for the markets. Flip side of that is B, lots of commonality, but 
you know, too much commonality, not very distinct. And really, you're trying to say, okay, well, can we operate somewhere way out on here where we can get a good combination of commonality and distinctiveness uh, at the same time there? And so really, they advocate sort of a three-step approach uh, for doing this. Now, this has really kind of become the, the framework that I'm starting to hang different tools and different methods on that I'll go through here because I just like the way very simple in terms of break it, breaking down the problem. You have to think about first, you know, what are the products uh, that you're going to offer for the marketplace? And so we'll talk a little bit about that. What is then the commonality plan? So what, what are you going to share across these different products? And then what are you going to make distinct across them? Uh, so again, I think from in terms of framing the issue, framing the challenges there, the three steps are good. Uh, one of the things that then I found lacking in the article, though, and, and when you're trying to apply this is, all right, what are the tools and methods then for doing each one of these? And so that's what I'll kind of go into a little bit here uh, for the rest of the talk. And then, like I said, show you how we've uh, been putting them together lately. So on the product plan, which products to offer when here? And really what we're thinking about, let me, let me talk a little bit so if you can read this, you know, which model concepts, variants do we deliver at what times to which target markets? What are the major options for each model and each market and each variant? And one of the tools that I found very uh, useful for helping with this is something called a market segmentation grid. And again, this is from uh, Mark Meyer and Al Leonard's book uh, that really just, again, a fairly simple sort of framework that just forces you when you're starting to, you know, plan product uh, families or think about products, just forces you to think about what are your range of options? What are the range of customers, the range of users that you're trying to, to target or satisfy? And not only in terms of uh, the different market segments here, but also in terms of within each segment from, you know, low cost, sort of bare bones, uh, you know, low performance all the way up to uh, the Rolls Royce, the high end, the luxury model there. And then thinking about, all right, well, this is now you've got a two by two grid and how do we go about spanning that different market? And okay, let's define what is our platform, what are our derivative products, and how are they going to then attack that market space? And using that as a tool just to kind of get you uh, moving forward to thinking about that. So within their uh, initial article, they really outline sort of four different approaches. This is sort of the typical, goes with that first quote that I showed you, you know, one product per, you know, per segment, per, you know, price performance tier, product one, product two, product three, probably not a lot of sharing, not a lot of commonality in there. This is where you run into, you know, reinventing the wheel each time, duplication of efforts, you know, a lot of uh, missed opportunities there on the product side, on the, on the development side, on the marketing side, on the manufacturing side. And really, you want to try and look at some combination of uh, two, three, or four here, thinking about, all right, are there opportunities to leverage across market segments, which, given the way this chart is laid out, is referred to as horizontal leveraging, do that at the low end or the high end? Or can we, within a particular segment, leverage up, scale up, or scale down, start with a high end, go low, or start with a low end and go high, uh, or obviously some combination thereof, the sort of beachhead approach, start with one, horizontally leverage it, vertically leverage it, and attack everything. Obviously, this is, this is the most challenging to do, and uh, you know, in all three of these cases here, these platforms, you know, you now, if there's something wrong with your platform, one of those uh, common elements uh, needs to be recalled or something like that, now all of a sudden, you know, everything has to be recalled that's, uh, that's, that's based off of that. So you, uh, you, know, you open your, you expose yourself to more risk in some case. You can also run into problems here. You know, if you're a low end, low end brand, are people gonna believe you if you start trying to then offer a high end model based on that? Or likewise, if you're a high end and you start scaling your products down, is that gonna hurt, you know, the margin you can charge, the premium that you have uh, on your high end platform there? Of course, in all these cases, the goal is though, leveraging or finding synergies from marketing, uh, design, development, manufacturing, logistics, supply chain, whatever, achieving better economies of scale by leveraging your platforms uh, across different market segments. So a couple of examples again, uh, tying here, uh, twin blade razors, Gillette, this was one of the ones from their example, uh, men's and women's. Anybody wanna guess what the, uh, what's the platform in each case there? The blade, so yeah, and that's why they spend billions of dollars on developing these blades now, and, and if you see their strategy, the new blade always comes out in the men's model, and then three or four months later, it comes out in the women. Of course, repeat that. So it went twin blade to advanced twin blade to triple blade, and you know, we're at quat you know, quattro and fusion, and you know, five now is fusion, quattro is, sorry, the competition. Uh, but anyway, you can see this sort of strategy, and they're investing billions of dollars to create that blade, and that's why those cartridges 
costs so darn much these days for your razor. So, but if, and if you look at this in terms of, you know, planning, you know, this is now sort of the strategy at Gillette there. Let's plan multiple generations, take the, you know, the twin blade. We're going to then have the advanced later on, again, men's and women's. And then once, once they got to the triple blade, they also started getting crazy uh, in terms of adding in, you know, the turbo, the power, the, uh, you know, the, the battery operated in there. And it's just crazy now the variety of features that, you know, a razor blade has for you. So... And this doesn't even show the, uh, the fusion and everything else that's out there. So, but anyway, just kind of neat, you know, these sort of maps to show how have things evolved one, or one another. And provides a good opportunity as well to kind of focus everybody on the same page and say, oh, well, you know, I'm supposed to be deriving this product from this platform and sharing this technology, et cetera. Uh, and how has that evolution occurred? Because a lot of times you're focused on your particular customer, your particular needs there, and you kind of lose sight of, uh, of the big picture. Of course, power tools as well, a lot of uh, strategies here with, you know, battery packs and, and that sort of stuff. And even in uh, DeWalt, for instance, you know, they leverage the uh, 9.6, the 12, the 14, 18, 24, and then with each one of those have sort of a, a beachhead because they then uh, not only vertically but expand out horizontally as well. And this is a case of trying to have very different uh, sort of brand uh, branding at the different levels there. People that are buying these are very different from the people buying these, the quality, the cost, uh, and that sort of stuff. And this also applies to really small consumer goods as well. One of the examples we talk about uh, in, in our textbook, and um, there's a former student of mine who's now out at uh, Northeastern, uh, started this company on uh, an ice scrapers, innovation factory. And uh, he was going to school at, uh, working at Ford at the time, going to school at, uh, at Wharton, doing the management technology, had a class from Al Leonard about using platforms and uh, on the flight to and from uh, Philly to uh, the West Coast to, to pitch an idea, ran into a bad snowstorm, and he and his buddy then started coming up with, hey, there's, you know, ice scraper blades, you know, you spend five bucks for them, they're, they're crappy, the blades don't bend, etc. So he put this, uh, the platform uh, sort of principles to use, and they created this FlexiBlade platform, and he likens it kind of the, uh, the DeWalt of ice scrapers, uh, if you will, there. But so basically, he and uh, his buddy designed this so that this was uh, a platform that was now leveraged, kind of the mid-size, small, single hand. This is a two-handed model, and then products for the uh, the higher, you know, the SUVs and that sort of stuff. But basically, reusing that technology, you know, ice scrapers, fairly mundane, not a lot of innovation there. But uh, the product actually did uh, did pretty well. Again, you can see the platform that then led to uh, several different products. Uh, that led to then the ice dozer family for him. And one of the things that he found out was as a new startup with a new product, you know, he couldn't go in to talk to Lowe's and Home Depot. You know, if he only showed up with one SKU, they, were, they weren't willing to talk to him. But he was saying, no, we got a whole product line. Here's the products. These have these options. These have these options. Basically helped him get in the door a lot easier because he was thinking about a whole range of products up front, uh, which was helpful for the company and obviously strapped for resources. Uh, the more they could leverage uh, you know, this one, the, the work they did on this across these other ones, um, uh, the better for them. So, so again, it's, it's uh, in terms of market segmentation, again, in each case here you kind of see uh, Mark, uh, Mark now talks more about in his latest book, thinking of this as more as uh, sort of uh, users and uses is kind of the way that he lays this out here. And it kind of just provides a nice way to sort of frame and set up the problem that then really then allows you for those next stages to think about what is the range of customer requirements that you're trying to design for. Is there so much difference across our different user groups or in terms of the users, you know, is there an obvious opportunity uh, to leverage the platforms and leverage the technology uh, as we move forward in the development stage? <laughs> so we've thought about our product plan. We've thought about some opportunities for the platform. Next step is to think about, all right, what are we actually going to make common? So which components and modules are we going to share within this? And again, thinking about uh, uh, from their figure there. So commonality, really the, the goal in commonality is to uh, improve your economies of scale. The more you can uh, uh, reuse parts, components, uh, doors in this case for the, uh, the 777. Good challenge here of the, uh, the passenger doors. There's eight of them on the 777. Each one of those used to be designed uh, a very unique hinge. Uh, that was all then basically customized to where it was located on the fuselage. And they said, well, you know, we're just duplicating all of our efforts. Can we redesign and have a common hinge? And after going back and forth several times, they ended up with a, uh, you know, the whole, all the guts, all the inside 
98% of that was common, which then you can imagine, all right, across eight doors, across all these different aircrafts, now you can test the heck out of this so you reduce your exposure your risk, you know, uh, in terms of this, get this hinge mechanism working once, better economies of scale, and a good, good story there in Sawboss book about the uh, uh, design of the 777. Happens at the, uh, uh, at the, the aircraft level too, uh, Airbus, the A3XX, uh, you can see there the 318, 19, 20, and 21 from their website, as you would expect, to sort of scale it or stretch more passengers, fly further, those sort of things. One of the things that I found very interesting about this, uh, there was an article in um, uh, Aerospace America in 2000 about uh, this quote here about the A330 cockpit. And it was interesting, even though that Boeing and Airbus had both sort of stretched or scaled their planes, they say in the quote here that Boeing actually had a more efficient or a better design uh, scaling the, uh, the 767. What really was helping Airbus or what was really selling uh, the airlines in this case was commonality in the cockpit because where is the cost for them? It's training their pilots and that sort of thing. And when they go sit in a Boeing 767-400 versus the 400ER versus this or that, all the controls, everything is a different place. And so now you've got to retrain uh, your operators rechange the pilots in this place versus the 300 family, this 3XX family, train on one cockpit and basically go and sit in any other cockpit there. So all of a sudden now, the airlines are seeing, you know, from understanding their users uh, and understanding really what are the opportunity, where's, you know, where are the economies of scale? In this case, it's training the pilots. And if we can then basically translate that into what we should make common, then in this case, Airbus the, uh, was outselling the more efficient uh, uh, Boeing aircraft of the same size. So commonality is both good and bad. I mean, obviously, uh, has lots of advantages, decreasing lead times, risk. We've already you know, used it, proven it here. Let's reuse it in a different market uh, segment. Uh, reducing your product line complexity, setting tool up time, fewer components you've got to store and track and inventory, test and qualify, et cetera. But on the flip side, has lots of disadvantages. And we've talked about the lack of distinctiveness the KCAR platform, again, getting used over and over and over again, uh, can hinder innovation and creativity. And, and a lot of times, you know, companies that I've dealt with, you know, they tend to set these sort of commonality targets. And, uh, uh, you know, then the, the designers feel, oh, well, I have to have 60% commonality. So then that's going to limit, uh, in some sense, or constrain what the, they're thinking uh, in terms of the design. Or worse, it's going to compromise their performance uh, of their product. And even worse, it's going to, they're going to cannibalize their own product. So again, with Volkswagen. Uh, Black & Decker, of course, has the same issue of cannibalization, but there it works, it works in their favor because people buy the DeWalt versus the lower end, and you can imagine that the margins are a lot higher on DeWalt than the lower end. So in that case, hey, it's, you know, it's good. It, it worked the opposite for, uh, for Volkswagen. There are a variety of indices uh, that are out there to try and measure commonality um, and, of course, uh, capture the benefits and avoid the pitfalls. My, I think this is my one equation in my my talk here, uh, product line commonality index. This was actually Sridhar Coder up in Michigan. Uh, developed this particular one. We've done some derivatives off of this uh, to try and capture some more things. But I like this because they really try and get at uh, essentially the um, uh, trying to make common only the components that are really uh, non-differentiating. So if you, uh, it's one of the few indices to recognize if you have a unique function. Uh, or a unique aspect to your product, then ideally, you know, you shouldn't be making that common. So don't penalize your sort of measures here. And all it is is simply looking across, you know, P different parts. We've got N components that are in each one of those. So uh, the example I'll show you here in a minute is Sony Walkmans. Um, basically, you know, four, four Sony Walkmans. We look at each component in that. And then we have these three F factors. Again, another aspect of this measure that I like that allows us to say, all right, are the size and shape common? That's one factor. Are the material manufacturing common? Uh, is there assembly and joining factors common? In this case, you can have, well, it's different size or it's a different shape, but it's made the same way and it's made of the same material in this. So it, it allows you sort of partial commonality, uh, reward that within your measures there. So uh, again, the, the example initially from his paper uh, was Sony, the Walkmans uh, that I mentioned. You can see the score is based on this measure, 91% commonality uh, within the family of Walkmans compared to uh, a like, likewise set of uh, RCA and Radio Shack, 40 and 50%. So obviously, Sony is getting much better uh, economies of scale from this. Uh, and again, this sort of shows you how, in this case, you know, this might be the reverse button. There's four of them. One over N squared is that. They're all the same size, shape, material, manufacturing. Maybe this part uh, 
you know, two of, the, two of the four are the same, the others are all different here, so it allows you to sort of score uh, and count, count up the, uh, the commonality within your family. It's been a lot of use for uh, commonality indices, uh, both for design and redesign, uh, because they provide really a good surrogate measure for sort of your manufacturing costs and trying to quantify the benefits uh, of your uh, product family when the information isn't readily available. I really liken commonality indices to uh, sort of to redesign as uh, DFMA is to product redesign. So when you're thinking about a product family, commonality indices provide a good benchmark or a good measure. How much commonality do we have? All right, let's try and, try and improve it as we redesign our family. Likewise, when you're doing DFM. And really what I've seen as you go through the literature there, uh, you know, it, it goes by many different names depending on where you are in sort of the product development process there. So when you're talking about component commonality, the same words as, you know, a lot of people times talking about reuse. Well, we need to reuse these components, reuse these essentially. We're talking about having common components. On the manufacturing side, we want standardization. Commonality equals standardization. The more we can standardize, the better our economies of scale, et cetera. And when we're talking about an assembly side, there's a whole big literature on uh, postponement, delayed differentiation, basically commonality in your manufacturing processes applied to assembly. And what I've seen and heard time and again, avoid commonality for the sake of commonality. Don't just make things common uh, because it sounds good or because somebody else is doing it. Uh, the companies I've seen and talked to, again, that have set targets just to set targets always seems to backfire for some reason or another. I do know companies that sort of monitor, it, monitor commonality and track it. We're working with some appliance companies right now to do that. Uh, but at this point, they're not prescribing it. And it does provide a good opportunity, as I said, to benchmark how are you doing compared to your competitors there. And again, another example here, Joint Strike Fighter from the military side on the aircraft. I like this. They actually, in terms of, uh, you know, commonality for the sake of commonality, if you're familiar with this, when it first started, they basically set extremely high targets, 70 to 90 percent commonality across these three different aircraft. The uh, conventional takeoff and landing, uh, short uh, takeoff and vertical landing, and then the carrier version here, which have very different needs uh, in terms of what they're trying to do. And to enforce 70 to 90 percent commonality on them at the start, simply to save you know, an estimated $15 billion and justify it to Congress to get the money is not necessarily the best reason to do this. Because as a result of that, as this evolved, in particular, the carrier model became way too heavy because we had to have way too much commonality among them project has, you know, almost been canceled, you know, many, many, many times as a result. And you can see now sort of where, where they've ended up. I like this, you know, common components are in green, unique are in pink, and they've created a new uh, cousin parts, which I've liked the, uh, the term there, sort of, you know, they're not, they're, not, uh, they're not twins per se, you know, distant cousins in your uh, family relationship here. So there's some similarity, uh, but they're different. So you can see, you know, nowhere near the 70 to 90 percent that, uh, that they had hoped for originally, so anyway. So that's in terms of commonality. There are plenty of measures and metrics that are out there for that, uh, depending on what you're trying to, to do with them, whether you're using them in optimization, uh, you want to factor in the cost, you want to just count components, et cetera. So uh, happy to point you to, to, to more resources there if you're interested. And, and a lot of these companies that when we talk to them, they really they come in and you know, this is what they're asking for, mainly for sort of benchmarking and that sort of stuff. The flip side of the coin then is, is our third and final piece, differentiation. How are we going to differentiate our products? How are we going to make them distinct? And as I mentioned already, modularity, probably the best known approach for doing this, for creating a cost-effective family. Um, you don't have to have a modular product to create a product family, although it does make it a lot easier. So I think there's, there's big literature, there's a huge literature in both the modular design side as well as the product family side. I'd say the overlap in the Venn diagram is pretty big. Uh, but there's separate work there as well. The idea what, where we're trying to take advantage of that in our product family is, again, add, subtract, remove modules that allow us to scale up or scale across different market segments as needed. So improve the performance of something, uh, upgrade it or, or add functionality uh, by adding more modules. And this comes from uh, you know, Ulrich uh, uh, and Eppinger's stuff there, Carl Ulrich's work, you know, defining the architecture uh, is mainly the arrangement, what are the functional elements, what's the mapping from function to form, physical components, and then importantly, what are the interfaces? And I think really this, the interfaces here, particularly for product families, becomes critical because this allows or, or dictates in some sense the plug and play and the, the upgrade ability or the, 
the evolvability of your platform. When we think about a, a family, the common modules really translate in the platform. And then by standardizing the interfaces, this is what allows the, the add, subtract, remove, substitute there uh, as needed. So simple example, Braun coffee makers. Uh, basically, we want to create coffee, you know, make coffee. We put our water, we put our coffee grounds in. The green are the functions. We got to store the water, we got to store the coffee, we got to mix them, we got to heat them, uh, store the coffee after it's ground, electricity comes in, coffee comes out. And that is the basic functionality for any coffee maker that's out there. And if you look at Braun's product line, that's the KF130 that retails for, you know, $19.99 at Walmart or whatever it is. Well, if you go and look at the KF145, they add one function. It's a water filter that separates in there. Everything else is the same. And now we're going to charge you $24.99 for this. And so we can keep this progression going. We want to be able to store it in a thermos. We want to add the shutoff clock feature. We want the adjustable heater. You know, we want our lattes and our froth milk, et cetera. Each one of these adds a little bit of functionality. The architecture doesn't change. You're adding a couple of modules or you're changing some of the features. And each one is a new price increment, five, ten dollars or whatever, on top of what you've done. But, it, you know, common to all of those is making coffee. When you tear apart products, similarly to think about, you know, you've got your common components, your unique components, uh, and then your variant components, similar to what I showed you already, the common uh, cousin uh, and unique from, the, uh, from the, uh, the Joint Strike Fighter there. But again, you can see this in a lot of products uh, that we take apart. And really the goal is try and maximize, uh, when we're thinking about a family, try and maximize uh, the commonality, uh, create unique components that provide sort of the unique functionality, and then uh, kind of have the variant, the variant ones in the middle there that are spanning or, or sort of making the transition between, uh, between the two. Again, automotive moving very heavily into the, uh, the modular uh, world these days to facilitate assembly. I like the, um, uh, found this example a couple years ago, the, uh, the rolling chassis module for uh, Dana Corporation. Again, talking about sort of the, uh, you know, this looks very similar. Uh, I show this for uh, uh, Daimler Chrysler, you know, in terms of the, uh, the Volkswagen A platform that I showed you before. Very similar here in terms of the common underbody that is then reused. Uh, in this case, this shows up at the, the factory floor there. 25% uh, of vehicle content and saved, uh, you know, almost three quarters of a billion dollars for the, uh, the Dodge Dakota facility that they uh, put in to make these particular cars. And of course, I think this is probably the, the, the extreme there, smart cars, which we're now starting to see driving around the, the US, been in Europe for a while now. It's the whole chassis is the same, identical. And so where does the uh, you know, the modularity in some sense come in is you can very easily snap off the body panels, put on a different one, and voila, you've changed your car from yellow to red in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes and go from there. So again, it's coming down to when you're creating this product family, how do you know or, you know, what are sort of the models, uh, the measures, the user groups, uh, the, the markets that you're trying to target that say this is, you know, for this particular product, this is the, the architecture that we need, and then that defines uh, the curve on which we're operating. It was interesting, Detroit Auto Show, uh, again, four years ago, Mercedes, um, uh, that actually owned Smart uh, for a while there. This is their very research car, and you can see trying to take this to the extreme uh, in the, uh, the, the um, convertible two-door and the hatchback model here. So you go, got four, four guys come in, pop some latches, pop the top off, uh, and voila, now you've gone from a uh, you know, the, the sedan to the two-door sports car. And uh, I haven't seen any of these on the road lately, but, uh, you know, who knows where they'll, they'll go with this. So, you know, some, again, some examples of modularity uh, in the automotive world. The other side, as I mentioned, is uh, sort of the scale-based, uh, scaling or stretching your platform uh, in one or more dimensions to satisfy a variety of market niches. And again, aircraft examples, some good, uh, aircraft industry, some good examples there, Boeing 737 is actually divided into three different platforms, the one in 200, 345, and then six to nine. And so you can actually look at, they, they give all their specs online now and everything is pretty cool. Go in and see, all right, how do they actually scale or stretch? You know, what's the uh, wing uh, engines, wingspan, tails, et cetera, all the same. You know, we're just stretching the fuselage, making it a little bit longer each time, fly further, carry more passengers. 777 was designed sort of to be stretched, 787. Uh, the Dreamliner as well, trying to embody these principles in there. Uh, and again, leverage, you know, the investment to create a new aircraft is, 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 you know, oodles of money these days. We want to be able to leverage that uh, as much as we can. 
at the component level too, scaling and stretching, you can find in the uh, aircraft industry, this is the Rolls-Royce uh, engine there. You can see the, uh, the RTM, the 322. Um, uh, the, the black was then leveraged to three different ones, the, the turbo shaft prop and fan. And they actually scaled this then by a factor of 1.8 to create a new series. And where was, the, where was the return on investment for them? It was then in expediting the testing and certification that for FAA and everything else because they showed that this was a scaled version of this earlier one that they had gone through this whole process, they were able to field that one much more quickly. Same sort of changes from there, and then voila, move forward uh, from that. So in terms of uh, our final tool here to help us try and pinpoint, you know, you know, whether we create these modules, common, unique, how do we standardize our interfaces, what do we scale or what do we stretch? One of the best tools I've found out there is, again, from Mark Martin and uh, Kosishi's work uh, out at Stanford, Design for Variety, and they have a... Uh, a generational variety index that they're really looking at sort of what is the extent of redesign uh, across different market segments. And really where it's useful is helping you determine which element should you platform and which one should you make unique. So if you're familiar with QFD, Quality Function Deployment, House of Quality, starting out with, you know, what are our different markets, creating your QFD matrix, and then really then is kind of adding on to the QFD, thinking about Again, ranges of requirements, ranges of user needs, ranges for our different uh, customer segments. So what are the expected changes? What are then, how are the changes going to affect our engineering metrics in the house of quality? Uh, having target values for those and then computing a, uh, a GVI matrix and then calculating it. And so if you go, the example that he uses in there is a, uh, a water cooler, uh, current future markets, and really what we're doing you know, so you say, all right, well, here, what does the customer want? They want fast cool-down time, cold water, high capacity, you know, low energy. What does that translate to in terms of the things that I can design uh, from the engineering perspective, you know, uh, or the, the, the engineering requirements for me in the exit show, the, uh, the mapping there? And really what he's done is just adding sort of more uh, layers to the basement of the uh, house of quality. So current market and then future markets here and then showing how do our engineering parameters change uh, across those different markets. His, he looks across time. You could also just look across uh, market segments uh, uh, within, uh, you know, at, at one time shot uh, as well here. And then to go through those seven steps, uh, I won't take you through them in, in detail other than to show sort of how the customer requirements, if you're familiar again with QFD, translate in your engineering requirements, translate in the components, and then really all he does is with this matrix for each X, think about to what extent is that component, is it going to have to change or be redesigned to uh, create this family of products or to be able to satisfy these different markets. And then you add everything up and voila, you've got your uh, GVI values at the very bottom here. And these tell you now, as you've done, gone through or done this process, uh, the higher GVI values, these are components, modules, subsystems, or whatever, that are going to have to be redesigned from one market to the next. So basically, these are the, uh, these are the uh, elements that you are not going to be able to platform. It's the, uh, the lower values, the low GBI values, basically is the things that you're going to want to platform because they're not going to change over time. And as long as you then standardize the interfaces between sort of the low and the high GBI values, then that's going to help you basically create, uh, create your platform then as you move forward and figure out, all right, how is it going to evolve and try and then minimize the redesign effort uh, based on sort of this, uh, this analysis here. So I've seen one or two sort of follow-on papers with this and, and a couple of companies that are starting to, to use this and take advantage of this because a lot of them use this, uh, the QFD house of quality approach to do that. And like I said, it's, whoops, um, there we go. Uh, just a, a slight, if you're familiar with that process, uh, just a slight tweak to that. So let me talk about an example of some work that's going on right now where we've actually been, you know, kind of putting all these tools together. And really a lot of the work here today is, has been uh, really looking at how do we try and integrate all these different tools um, and sort of match the inputs from one to the outputs of other and, and show how they can kind of come together into a more integrated or sort of a holistic approach to uh, thinking about product families. So this is work that uh, a project a year and a half that we're into now, we're uh, a branch of the military contacted us. We have the Applied Research Lab uh, at Penn State that does a lot of work with uh, DOD and whatnot. 
Uh, so we want some help defining the, the next generation uh, uh, family of robots. Uh, we want to think about a, a family of them, mainly that share common parts and modules uh, and also offer better plug and play uh, functionality. So as you can imagine, the first step was, well, what's, what's currently out there? What's currently being used? And so you can see sort of for this particular group with the needs that they wanted, uh, these are sort of the four, uh, you know, main leading products that are available on the marketplace. The, uh, the very small bomb bot that's mainly, uh, you know, blow and go. These things, they send them out, they, they find the IED, they find the bomb, they don't come back. So they're not very expensive. Uh, they're souped up RC cars, essentially. Versus the high end, the RONs here, this is several uh, hundred thousands of dollars. You don't want this thing to blow up, uh, obviously, when it goes out there to do its job. Uh, and then these guys in between now, uh, you know, are adding the talent and the pack bot are having different capabilities in terms of not only sort of diffusing uh, IEDs and that sort of stuff, but also trying to do, uh, to, you know, recon on them and, and uh, uh, investigation and that sort of stuff. So, so we went about, we got actually uh, got access to all of these uh, and we were able to take them apart and uh, sort of do some reverse engineering on them and understand uh, sort of what were, the, what were the capabilities and how were they put together. Uh, but really, as part of this, again, tying back to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to Robertson and Ulrich's chart there, on the product plan side, you know, not only did we look at what is already existing, but then we sort of had those same questions. Well, what are our target markets in terms of thinking about future products? What are our target market segments, quote unquote? Sort of what's the functionality that's needed for each segment? Uh, you know, what are the user needs? So we're out there talking to... Uh, you know, members of the, uh, the different services that, uh, that, that this group was working with. Uh, we're talking to people at, uh, you know, in logistics and in the, in the maintenance. We're talking to the users, uh, the techs themselves, and trying to, uh, you know, reconcile all these sort of differences and come up with a list of sort of needs and wants. You've got your thresholds and you've got your objectives. The thresholds have to be met. And the objectives sort of are the what, you know, what have be meant. So. Uh, when we started this project, we were given a very long list of uh, mission scenarios that basically that came our, uh, uh, defined our markets. And you can imagine with where the, uh, the military has deployed these days, the sort of terrains and conditions uh, in those countries uh, vary different quite a bit, uh, but also some sort of urban you know, reconnaissance use, et cetera. Each uh, mission scenario had a huge set of capabilities. These are just a, a few of the examples there, you know, typically how far can this, uh, this robot go, how fast can it go, can it climb over curbs, or can it go over rubble, you know, that sort of stuff is what we were then uh, trying to go through. And each one of these then had a threshold objective that was then defined by a, uh, a requirements working group that we got down and, and, and talked to several times. And then the goal was really to think about, you know, we went back and, you know, you've got now, these are four of several systems that are currently deployed and out there. And you can imagine what are some, you know, from the, the military's perspective, what is the, you know, what's one of the downsides or disadvantages of having all these different systems? Again, it's similar to the training for each, you know, each one has a different OCU uh, control, uh, user input, uh, logistics. You got to carry around parts to supply all of these. Functionality is different for all of these, et cetera. So again, can you with this family share, you know, have some better commonality across there? And so. Uh, sort of at the end of the day, it was, you know, loosely, you know, more than one, but probably not more than three different types because they're all kind of in, you know, they're small, they're sort of medium, and then there's really, really big, you know. So in terms of this, this kind of covers all their uses now, what we're really looking for is are there opportunities for more commonality within this family. So again, sort of going through and understanding, you know, what are the, what are the customer needs in this case? Uh, very different from uh, consumers, but nonetheless, uh, customers with different markets and different functionality that's defining different segments. So are there opportunities for commonality? Well, as I said, we took apart uh, existing architectures and at the end of the day when you tear those apart, there's really not a lot of difference between them. So this is a design structure matrix that basically lists all the components and then each one of these shows you either a, a low, medium, or a high interaction between, uh, between those components within that system. And this is actually sort of the generic uh, across all four of those. Yes, they have a little bit different you know, size and shape, but in terms of, you know, motors are connected to the gears, are connected to the wheels or, you know, the chassis and that sort of stuff. And likewise, then we took that and went through and propagated all the way through our, uh, that GVI analysis. And we said, okay, based on those customer needs, how is that going to change our engineering requirements? And for every uh, mark that was in there, it's slightly different. You know, let's look at to what extent is that going to have to be redesigned, compute our GVI, and then from that, identify what can we platform 
and what do we need to change? So start of a commonality plan, you know, batteries, obviously. You know, there's identical, there's opportunities. Everybody needs a battery. Can we share and reuse that? Variants, you know, arms. You know, there are opportunities to share or leverage common arms uh, across different chassis, small, medium, and large. And finally, unique functions. You know, this, uh, the RONS has flippers that allows it to, uh, to climb and stand up on its toes and that sort of stuff. So there are some uh, scenarios that have very unique requirements that, that are going to need that. So again, trying to look at can we maximize, uh, drive a lot more things, commonality um, on the component side, on the controller side, et cetera, uh, have some variant modules and unique ones. Behind all of this to help us make decisions, we actually had to create a lot of rules. I think a lot of the work we end up doing is actually uh, creating simulation models uh, or rule sets to be able to simulate the robot system and look at, all right, drivetrain, power, chassis, manipulator, you know, basically get down to the actual components here, uh, validate, make sure that these are valid against existing robots. And this is what we've spent probably two-thirds of the project on was creating the rules to then allow us to then make some of these trade-offs and make some of these decisions. Because once we had all these rules together, uh, validated them on some of the existing models, we can then start to generate different designs. And so now this is really where, in terms of these looking at parametric variations across, you know, a small and medium and large, so the vehicle mass, uh, this, so this is the vehicle mass axis. We've got the size on the, into the, uh, uh, on the diagonal in the plane. And then what we've shown here is a, for each one of those robots, we compare it against our threshold and objective, and we compute an effectiveness score. And so this plane then shows you, we said, all right, let's just take a 75% effective. Basically, we're going to, these designs, we're going to throw them out for now uh, because they're, they're not doing very well. You can see, you know, designs, we actually don't have any designs that are 100% effective. But across the small, the medium, and the large, can we now create a family that's going to do very well uh, across all these different scenarios? So pick, pick, basically then we pick one point from each one of those. Uh, we then group them into families, and we look at average effectiveness and the similarity, say, you know, with, let's take, you know, this point, this point, and that point. We'll look at the average effectiveness. We'll look at the similarity across them, and then that might be, I don't know, maybe that point right there or whatever. Because now each point in this is a family uh, in this plot right here where we're looking at basically back to, uh, to Robertson and Ulrich's. This is commonality. And this is, you know, distinctiveness here measured in terms of effectiveness for our different market segments. And for those of you that uh, optimization, here's our Pareto front are the ones, the, uh, the black crosses there. So essentially, out of all, uh, you know, a couple thousand different fam potential families, really we want to focus on, you know, these six because they give us, in this case, this family is the most effective. It has a little bit less commonality, but it's the most effective. Likewise, here is the most common, but not as effective as this one. And we lucked out. We got one here with a good architecture that had a really good, comp you know, a good compromise solution that was both, uh, you know, we lose, say, one, maybe 2% effectiveness, but look how much commonality that we have gained from that. And then so from there, that's kind of where this, the stage we are now, uh, reviewing these recommendations with, uh, uh, with, with the working group and, and um, uh, with the organization we're working with. And I can't really show the actual numbers here, but I did want to kind of highlight, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, sort of a sanity check, the most effective family, you know, here is across the one, two, three robots, things that are in orange are identical, common parts. And so this shows you, you know, within the chassis, three dimensions that we're looking at, mobility, batteries, and motors. These were the things that we created our modules for, you know, three or four dimensions that define each one of those. And as you might guess, you know, we, we actually had a good family here that has a lot of similarity, say within about 5% or so in terms of the, the, the parametric uh, variation there, that seems like there's some really good opportunities for commonality and we use in the family that, uh, that, that the robot manufacturers haven't tapped into yet. And so now the goal is to try and convince them that this is what we, uh, we want to do. So again, most effective family has some commonality, but, but not as much. Obviously, this, you know, performs a little bit better. So this is sort of the, the most promising solution that we're, we're running with now. So summary, uh, end of all this here. So product family, product platform design is a, is a fairly difficult and challenging task. Hopefully you picked that up here. And it really it involves all the complexities uh, of product development compounded now by the fact of trying to coordinate this across 
multiple products. I actually have a student who's at uh, Chrysler. He's in charge of uh, trying to uh, have some engine commonality. He says, you know what? Platforms and commonality, it's a pain in my ass because anytime one of my engine designers changes something, I gotta go and negotiate with the other two or three to make sure that they're okay with that change. So this coordination, uh, good or bad, you know, it may save you dollars, but now you need somebody running around doing that all for you. And, and again, there's, you know, there's trade-offs there. There are a lot of tools that are out there. Um, this is, like I said, we're trying to, we, we spent a lot of time kind of getting to know the, uh, the, the ins and outs of each of them and are now trying to really look at how do we integrate these together. And really, you know, what I'm finding, there's no silver bullet. Depending on the, the product line, depending on the company, and really depending on the industry, I think the industry drives, in a sense, you know, what, we, what we should think about commonality and then really how the company implements that is what gives them their competitive advantage for a particular product line. But hopefully the, the takeaway is here, you know, to think about, you know, if we think about range of customer requirements, there's several different ways to leverage our platform. And then thinking, of course, about module-based and scale-based. And really, you know, it's, it's not design and engineering doing this alone. You know, you got to bring in the tools from marketing and management. You got to bring in, uh, you know, manufacturing, production, supply chain, and make sure that really these decisions are optimal not only for you, the company, but you know, for the customers as well, because they're the ones ultimately buying, this, uh, uh, buying these products. So I'll end with this. If you're interested in reading more, as I said, um, uh, Mark Meyer and Al Leonard's book, Power Product Platforms, uh, is a great first read, good examples, and, and uh, sort of is the book on uh, product platform and planning. There was a good book on product variety and management in 1988, sort of a collection of papers. Uh, a little bit outdated now, but again, some great examples that are in there. Uh, if you're looking, a lot of companies these days are using this modular function deployment, kind of uh, QFD uh, uh, for modular design, module drivers. Uh, Erickson and Erickson's book is, uh, is, a good, is a good read and overview of that. And then we put together, uh, shoot, four years ago now, sort of a follow-up to the, uh, the yellow one, but looking at it, you know, methods and applications. Uh, there's four case studies in there and then about um, uh, 20 different chapters from, uh, from leading researchers uh, and, and a couple of practitioners in the field uh, looking at product families and, and platforms and what are the tools out there for, for doing that. So with that, I'll end and uh, be happy to answer any questions that you might have.